Father, we thank you for your great love towards us. A love we are just able to catch little glimmerings of because we don't have the equipment. Help us, Lord, to sense that trusting you is the best thing we can do. Help us, Lord, to catch new visions today as you reveal to us what you mean by the word love. We'll be studying throughout all eternity, but we need to know something now. Help us. Give us your spirit in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You know, when people say the word love, they can mean all kinds of things. You don't really know what they're saying, and they probably don't know either. Most people, when they say the word love, they're talking about some wishy-washy, cuddly, muddly, fuzzy feeling of some sort. But this is not the kind of love that God is talking about. The kind of love that God talks about, he didn't even have a word for. And so he took a word from the Greek that did not mean to the Greeks what God was going to do with it. <laughs> yes. The word for love to the Greeks was philia, phileo, the way it comes out, which we understand is brotherly love. But that kind of love that the Greeks understood as love was this warm feeling you felt for someone that you bonded with, that you were cordial with. You loved them. Okay? That's how they understood the word love. But phileo could not possibly be the word that God would use for love because it doesn't do what he wants love to do. Now, it will include, of course, feelings and being warm and some of these things, but that's not everything that love is about. So God had to take another word that the Greeks used in an entirely different way, the word agape. Now, we today take it for granted that agape means certain things, but I think we need to really go back and look at this because the Greeks did not use agape to mean what we say it means today, especially the theologians. The word agape to the Greeks, up until the time of Christ, meant esteem. Yeah. Esteem. And so, if we look at that word, well, well is that the love that God's talking about? Well, we need to, to take that word and see why he picked that word. Hiding within that word also was the word respect. That was the definition of the word agape to the Greeks. You find it in their ancient writings. The word agape means respect, esteem. Okay? Now, why could not God use the word Phileo to portray what he means by love. Well, think about phileo for a moment. What is it based on? Your feelings. <laughs> See? And how long do your feelings last? <laughs> See? So God could not use that word because it's not permanent. <laughs> He had to have a word that would go beyond the feelings and always be there. See? 
So we begin to understand the problem he had in finding a word in, in language that would say what he wanted to say and what he meant. But he picked the word agape and then he began putting things into that word through Jesus. Because Jesus is agape. <laughs> okay. With that little introduction now, we want to try to understand what the difference is between agape and what man calls love. I better tell you right at the outset here that man's word for love we know is not agape. I mean, how many people out there respect everybody? How many people esteem everybody? How many people? I mean, all you have to do is pick up a magazine and they're sneering at somebody. <laughs> Time magazine a week ago, they put on the front of that thing one of the worst <laughs> sneers around today. That's amazing to me. So what does man call love? What you can do for me. I will love you for that. <laughs> and the word, there's a word for it. The word is eros. Now, the theologians have messed up the, the concept of eros and agape. They think That eros always means a certain thing about passion, the body. And they say that agape never can have that. We're going to look at that concept to see how that's so wrong and what it does and where it came from. Because theologians have fallen into the middle of that trap and they've come up with something that we know is wrong once we hear it. Okay? But we have to lead into this. Eros is first of all inward. It takes whatever it finds in the world and it brings it in. It's for me. I get to use it. I get to enjoy it. I get to have it. It's greed. <laughs> it's self. That's what eros is. Immediately we can sense eros is the enemy of agape. Because agape to esteem has to go out. <laughs> and so agape is outward seeking the other. Always the other is the center. Not me. So the word egocentric means eros. <laughs> okay. Everything coming in always to me. And agape, the word God is going to use to show what love is, is always going out to the other. And it's something that's difficult for us to understand. But the others are our center. You see? I am other-centered. My center is out there. I don't have a center without the others. <laughs> and so a loner is a perversion of humanity. There's no such thing in God's plan. You can't be a loner in the kingdom. <laughs> You have to be part of everybody else, others. And of course, when you have the others, the only reason you can do that is there is one other, God himself. He is my center. I have no being without him as my center. So 
I'm going to give you two words. It's not important you remember them. But I want to give them to you so you remember that this is much bigger than theologians have understood. This is biblical. And there are Bible words and concepts that the theologians just don't get. The first word is alterocentricity. A-L-T-E-R. And that just means other-centered. Okay? Alterocentricity. The other word is autarkeia. A-U-T-E-R-K-E-I-A. And that means self-dependent. Okay? Those are two absolutely opposite ideas and concepts. The natural human being is self-centered. The Christian that has found realism again instead of the fake world we live in, he has found that realism is other-centered. Alterocentricity. And this is what happens to a person when they're converted. They become ultracentric. This is why service to God is what we've been talking about for over a year here. You cannot be a Christian without being service-oriented because the others are where your center is. <laughs> okay? This is the first clue when a person can find out that they're not a Christian yet. All they think about is themselves. Agape, then, goes out to the others. And in order for that to work, the person has to be humble. Okay? Because if you're not humble, you're going to start arguing with people right away because they don't agree with you. <laughs> okay? You, you have to be humble to deal with others. That humility in the Bible takes the form of going down, of bending down. See? I better say something else so you understand what I'm saying here. The pagan is always reaching up. It's called ambition. It's called improving myself. It's called whatever. But the pagan is always reaching up. And where is he ultimately reaching for? He's reaching for God. Yeah, the pagan is reaching for God by saving himself. By doing what he thinks is best for himself. Climbing, climbing, climbing to get to God. <laughs> but altruocentricity can't do that because it finds its center in God. And the humble one knows, I can't reach God by climbing up. I'll never do it. So what do they have to do? They have to wait for God to come down. <laughs> See? And God in coming down to us, that's the only way, shows something about who he is. He is the humble one. Now, what kind of a God is that? Theologians don't know about that God. See? And the churches don't teach that kind of a God. But that's the real living God of the scriptures. The one who is humble, who comes down to us because we can't move. Didn't Jesus say it? Learn of me. I am meek and lowly of heart. Well, when he said that, who were we supposed to see? Were we supposed to look at Jesus and say, well, that's it, that's Jesus? No, he came to reveal the Father and what he was saying. The Father, the sovereign God of all eternity, says, I am meek and lowly of heart. 
It's my glory to bend down to you. And the theologians say, that's unreasonable. <laughs> it makes no sense. And they say, it can't be true. You know where the theologians go? And the theologian I'm thinking about is Nigrin. He is the one who wrote an agape and eras. He is the authority. And he says, there is no reason, no logical reason for God to love man. Man is totally unworthy. God shouldn't love him. <laughs> Well, there's an element of truth in that, but he messes it up. He messes it up. We're going to see how he messes it up. These theologians will trap you because they say a truth here and then a lie here and a lie here and a truth there. You can't keep up with them. <laughs> when I first went to the seminary years ago, I thought I was going to go insane. They made me read all this stuff. And I couldn't make any sense out of it. I said, what's wrong with me? They make no sense. <laughs> it wasn't until after I left the seminary I found out why they didn't make sense. It's all nonsense. <laughs> all right. So this, this thing that Eros does, It splits people up. It doesn't bring people together. It causes ruptures. When I want me being fulfilled all the time, what's it going to do to you? See? So it's splitness. It breaks things up. It's a rupture. It's constantly destroying. But God's agape brings things together and makes it a totality. And you are made whole. Didn't Jesus say you are made whole? That's what he meant. You have joined all the others who are in God's kingdom of grace. You're made whole now. You have your others. And because you have that relationship with God's children, now you realize all those lost ones are also God's children, but they're still outside. Yeah. I'm going to talk more about that in just a few moments here. So this, this splitness is ruptured. This, this thing about me first. Watch out for number one. There's another name that we have put to it in Seventh-day Adventism. We don't talk philosophically. I'm giving you high terms that we can go into the Greek language and into the minds of the best thinkers on this planet. But I want to give you the thought that God has given us as a people what to call eros. The word is spiritualism. Uh -huh. That's what Ellen White calls spiritualism. And she defines it very clearly what spiritualism is. It's nothing more than eros, the opposite of agape. So hang in with me because we're starting to move a little bit into this to see why it's so important to understand what God has done instead of what the theologians have said. Eros, then, is totally against reality. In the Bible, the word reality is not found, but the Bible has another term it uses. You see, you have to know the concepts before you can look for the absence of the words. The Bible words for reality are love of the truth. <laughs> That's reality. And when a person doesn't have a love for the truth, they can never come to agape. They're going to always be in eros. <laughs> And many of us have been in Eros and didn't know it because we didn't know how, what God called it. But there's a way out once we understand what agape is. And it becomes a very beautiful thing that God wants Seventh-day Adventists to do in the world. 
We're to present to them agape. Not Saturday is the Sabbath. Saturday being the Sabbath is very important. You can't keep the commandments if you don't know that. But anybody can go to church on Saturday instead of Sunday and think they're a Christian. And maybe they aren't. You're not a Christian until you have agape. Agape is another name for Jesus. He turned it out to be that way. Agape created the world. The, the biggest thing in God's creation is agape. Now that we have the right word saying the right things. Didn't Paul say the greatest of these is love? Well, we'll go on here. Eros then, being a, a non-reality, Eros being spiritualism turns out to be a religion. So there are two religions in this world, Eros and Agape. Everything Eros sets out to do doesn't work. And Eros just discovers one thing, that whatever it brought in to satisfy itself turns out to be empty. <laughs> Nothingness. There is no true value there. But the theologians say Eros has the real value. That's a really strange thing. I don't want to get too much into the theological side of this because they're so messed up. So what does reality do? If reality is love of the truth and the ultimate truth is God, it takes you to responsibility. Uh, <laughs> now I am responsible to agape God. And Harris never likes that. I wasn't going to get into this, but I think I'm going to say just a word here so we understand a little bit more about this. Eros in the mail always turns out to be a playboy. That's right. Always. A playboy looks around and sees something that's enticing and says, that's for me. <laughs> me. And the playboy doesn't care if that object has a brain or not. <laughs> or if it's a person or not. It's just something that I can have ecstasy with so I can forget my world. <laughs> and I can drift out here with this ecstasy for a little bit, and I have no more problems. Women aren't like that. Sometime I'm going to go back and show you how God designed women to be, and they're in much better shape than men about understanding agape. They have some things built into them to understand agape, but men don't. They're eros all the way. <laughs> okay, so, so we have this thing about this playboy enjoying the world that he wants to have when he wants it to forget. And it begins molding his whole life, how he sees things, how, how he builds a secret life now, how he, he thinks nobody knows anything, and he can live two different ways at the same time. It's a miserable thing. Mm -hmm. But something wakes him up because women are the way they are. This object that he has talked into being with him for a while for his ecstasy all of a sudden does something that just really messes up his brain. She says, how about discussing something a little bit more permanent? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, what? 
what? And she says, commitment? Responsibility? And oh, <laughs> responsibility! That's the last thing an Eros male wants, is responsibility. And now he's in a panic. He said, where did this come from? <laughs> So now you get a little bit more idea of what I'm talking about here. Eros is the opposite of agape. He doesn't care about her as a person. It just doesn't happen. And all a woman has to say is that little magic word. Let's, let's, let's make this legal. <laughs> and it's over. Yeah. At this point, I should say something because we probably won't get back to the thought. The theologians think that eros is the only place you can have sexual behavior because that's what, to them, eros means. And it never enters their mind that God didn't make sexual behavior for eros. He made it for agape. And there's only one place agape can have that kind of behavior. That is with your spouse. No place else. Not even in your mind. Do you get why the devil has been so busy promoting errors? He knows he's going to make spiritualists out of Seventh-day Adventist men. Agape. Is straight line in God's kingdom. And he set up fulfillment of that part of marriage between a man and a woman and no place else. One man, one woman together. <laughs> so the playboy is illicit. There's nothing you can say good about a playboy. <laughs> Nothing, not one word. And so, the theologians say, well, Eros, you love the lovely. Which means, you cannot love the unlovable. <laughs> now, in their sense of logic, that might work. But then they say it about God. It is impossible for God to love the unlovable. <laughs> that makes him unreasonable. He's not rational if he loves the unlovable. It doesn't make sense. <laughs> but there's one thing they've left out of the equation, and that's why I'm even discussing this with you. That left out creation. They're evolutionists. You see the problem? So what, what do I mean creation? What's that got to do with all of this? What is man? We're only here because God created us. God created man. And the theologians say, well, yeah, but he fell, and he's worth nothing. He's an absolute wretch. There's absolutely nothing about him that can appeal to God. <laughs> but they are leaving out creation. If God created man. He must have had something in mind. God had a purpose for man to be created, and that was to live as a saint eternally with him. Now, I want to ask you, did Satan have the power to destroy God's purpose? No. No. Of course not. 
Now, we know that in our head, but think about it for a minute here. You are a total being. You've got to think with more than your brain. You're a total creature. You have a heart. You, you're, you are a soul. You are a living being, a total creature that God made for one purpose. That's to be a living saint. That's your purpose. Has God destroyed it? No. Has Satan destroyed it? No. There's only one person that can destroy it. When I don't believe it. Yeah, if I will not believe God's purpose for me is to be that holy being for all eternity. Now, let's take it one step further. God created me. His purpose in my creation is to live eternally with him and the angels and all other pure beings. So how does God look at this when he thinks about me and his purpose for me? He sees me eternally Finished and complete. <laughs> yeah, that's how he sees me in Jesus Christ. He says, oh, look at that. Walking on that planet, M1342, with so-and-so, all oh, over here today. Beautiful. <laughs> that's the way he sees his children. It's about time we started seeing ourselves that way. <laughs> Instead of grumbling and complaining, oh, how hard this is. Wait a minute. Who's making it hard? <laughs> it's not God. <laughs> it's Eros. It's Eros. We are believing Eros ideas instead of agape. God loves his creation. Now, maybe this will shock you. I don't know. But he doesn't love just the redeemed people. He loves all those lost ones. The same way he loves them. Yeah. Why? Why does he love that group and this group? And it doesn't make any difference about redemption. Why does he love them like that? Jesus died for everybody. <laughs> Not just for you. He died for all those people who are still lost. So what does that mean? When Jesus is asked, well, what do I need to do to be saved? What did he say? Love God with all your heart, with all your mind. With all your soul, with all your strength. You know, I've heard ministers of other denominations say our bodies have nothing to do with this. Well, why did Jesus say with all your strength? That's over there in Leviticus. With all your might, it says in Leviticus. Your soul doesn't have strength. It's your body that lifts rocks. <laughs> Your mind doesn't do that by itself. You have to have a body. So Jesus said, you serve God and love him and submit 100% to him with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your, your body, all your physical structures. You just give everything to him. What's the word? It's submission. Submission. To the other, see? Surrender. We know that word, don't we? <laughs> now, does that make sense or doesn't it? Is that something God shouldn't have said to us? And your neighbor as yourself. <laughs> oh, now, wait a minute. <laughs> that went too far. <laughs> I love myself. Leave the neighbor out of this. <laughs> 
Your neighbor as yourself? Sure, that's your other. You're not complete without that other. You're not whole. You're not total. Well, what other? My church people? No. <laughs> that wretched lost person there. Because Jesus added something. Once you got these together, he said, and your enemies. Oh, the heiress man can't do that. He said, no way. No way. But Agape says, your enemy. That is your enemy today. Two years from now, he could be your brother. <laughs> See? You have no enemies permanently. Everybody is potentially a saint in the kingdom of God, in God's mind. Jesus died for everybody. Well, that just wipes out the enemies. <laughs> they're not enemies to you. They think they're an enemy. But we better not see them as this thing to keep away. That makes them an object again. So Eros does something very interesting. When a person starts to think about things and start understanding what the Bible is saying. I says, well, we have to make this a little complicated. We'll do what the philosophers call duality. We'll make two things you have to deal with here. Instead of one, you have two things. Your body and your soul. <laughs> the body is, is miserable and rotten. And the soul is the only thing that's good. And so Eros got Plato out there for the Western mind to teach that to Western man, and all the churches teach it today. Yeah. Body and soul are two different things, and they exist separately. That's what Plato taught. He was a pagan. He was Eros. Had nothing to do with agape. So now you know where this body-soul dichotomy came from. It's eros becoming intellectual. And by the way, the worst thing that can happen to you is to become intellectual like the intellectuals. Intellectualism. To be intelligent is great. But to become an intellectual the way the church, uh, schools teach it is bad news. What they teach in, in intellectualism is how to make the absurd make sense. And I can give you all kinds of examples of that, maybe another time. So, this duality of body over there and soul over there then takes the next step. Faith is over there and works is over there, and you have one or the other. That's eros. That is spiritualism. So now you know what the spirit of prophecy meant. Great controversy when she says, the three get together, the false prophet, the beast, and spiritualism, it's because they're all three of them teaching spiritualism. Eros. You can't have faith that doesn't work. It's not possible. The inner always shows itself by going out. Alter us intricity, always going out. See? So faith works is one, one totality. We know these things, but we may not know the rationale behind them and where the pagans got their ideas. The Christian doesn't believe in the right thing. The Christian does the right thing. See, there's no such thing as believing in grace and then nothing happens. 
faith without works is dead. Isn't that what James said? It can't happen. It's not possible. In reality, it only happens in the theologians' minds. That strange never, never land. <laughs> And so the Eros person stands up and says, well, you can believe in all that stuff. I'm going to do my thing. Yeah, that's Eros. My thing. And one guy, I, one person even had a hit record with it, didn't he? I did it my way. <laughs> Eros! 100% Eros. Self-sufficient. So why did God come down? Why did he come down? The theologians say he did, did it spontaneously because there was no reason for it. <laughs> yeah, it's a big word with them. Spontaneity. Oh, throw it away. God doesn't do things spontaneously just because all of a sudden an idea popped in his head. God came down because man was worthy. Now see, you were agreeing with the theologians before that man is unworthy. Not for God to come down. Why would he come down if man wasn't worthy? What made him worthy? God made him. <laughs> yes, God came to you because you are worthy to be saved. You are so worthy to be saved that Jesus would have come if you were the only one he did it for. Just one. That's the minimum number. You know what theologians do with that one? They say Jesus would have come if nobody had been saved. No, that's stupid. <laughs> Why in the world would God do something that didn't have any results? <laughs> that's what you call unreasonable. But that's what theologians teach at the bottom line. No, Jesus would have come if there had been one only. Now that's love. That's agape. And so don't go around thinking of yourself as unworthy for God to save because you are worthy or he wouldn't have done it. And your worthiness, it didn't come from yourself, obviously. It comes from his evaluation of you. Now is somebody going to say that God's evaluation powers are no good? <laughs> you see what these theologians are doing? They're talking like Eros people. God knew what he was doing when he said Jesus. So we've got to save them. What's it going to cost? Yeah, what's it going to cost? The ultimate sacrifice, God himself. We don't understand it. The angels don't understand it. They say, what in the world did he see in man that he went through all this to save him? Yeah, the angels don't understand it. But they love us too because the Father loves us. <laughs> see? We are part of their other. And they would do anything to help us. And so God says the original purpose for man is going to be fulfilled. I redeem him so that I can have him living with me forever. And I see him like that already. <laughs> but he also sees the rebels. Because nobody's going to fool God. He knows the rebels are never going to choose to serve him and love him. And he sees them that way forever also. But he sees the redeemed right now in eternity. All right. 
that's a background, and I don't know why it takes me so long to build a background. <laughs> but that's the background. Let's look at the Bible to see how Jesus said it in a way that the, the Pharisees did not understand it, and I'm afraid many other people haven't either. Let's go to Matthew 20. I need to say something before we're done here about magic. Remind me if I don't get it done. (laughs) Okay, Matthew 20, verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is in a ho- that is an householder which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. Okay, we all know this story, but we want to see how Jesus said it. He went out about the third hour and he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. Notice that word, others. <laughs> and he said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right I will give you. And they went their way. Now when's the last time you were hired for a job, and somebody told you, well, I'll pay you whatever I think is right, and then you went to work. <laughs> okay, verse 5. He went out about the sixth and ninth hour and did likewise. About the eleventh hour he went out. And he found others standing idle and saith unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? They said, Because no man has hired us. He saith unto them, Go you also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall you receive. And so... When even was come, the Lord of the vineyard saith unto his steward, Call the laborers, and give them their hire, beginning from the last ones to the first. (laughs) So, and when they came, that were hired about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. Uh, That's a full day's work, according to what he told the first ones, okay? So he gave those who only worked an hour a full day's wages. But when the first came, let's see, they worked down there. They supposed they should have received more. Why did they think they were going to get more money than, than those 11th hour ones? They likewise received every man a penny. <laughs> And when they had received it, (laughs) they murmured. (laughs) You could just hear them grumbling. Oh, what is this stuff? (sighs) Against the good man of the house, saying, These last have wrought one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst not thou agree with me for a penny? (laughs) Take that thine is and go. I will give unto this last even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is thine eye evil because I am good? So the last should be first, and the first last, and many be called, but few chosen. Now the theologians get a hold of this story, and then they go to the Jews the way they thought about things, and then they go to a word called justice, and they said the guys who worked all day should have had more money. They should have had. This is unjust of that household steward to do that. (laughs) That's what modern theologians teach. Now, is that what Jesus meant? (laughs) Suppose Jesus had given those first ones more money. 
then what would have happened? He would have hurt them. He would have made them think they have a right to complain. But they didn't have any right. They got what they said they were going to work for. <laughs> Why did they want more money? <laughs> Jealousy. They saw what the last ones did. And they said, well, they shouldn't have that. They got the same as us. <laughs> they got the same as us. And here we said, well, yeah, that kind of makes sense. No, it doesn't. Agape doesn't think that way. Suppose you're in the church for 30, 40 years. And in the last week that salvation is open, you go out and you bring someone in. In heaven are you going to say, no, wait a minute, they're enjoying all the benefits of heaven that I did, and I was in the church 30 years. <laughs> You see how crazy it is? I don't know why these theologians don't know how to think any better than they do. Well, I do know. It's called eros. Agape does not think that way. Jesus said agape all the way through this. These people who came at the last part, they never even asked him how much are we going to get paid. You get that? They never asked. They just went to work. They were so happy to cooperate in that vineyard with the householder. They let it go, and he said, I'll do what's right. And they said, great, he'll do what's right. It's a privilege to work with him. Do you think it's a privilege to work with Jesus? Do you need to know what your wages are? <laughs> get out of Eros. Get out of it. It's a terrible position. Jesus spoke spiritual truth always. He never wavered. Before going on, there's a lot more that can be said about this story. I just want you to think about this. By the way, who did the best work? The ones who said we worked all day long in the heat of the sun. Did they do the best work or did the ones who came in at the end? Yeah. Why? Because they weren't complainers or grumblers. They weren't working for money. They were just working in cooperation with this householder. So I think he must have paid them that extra just because they were the better workers. <laughs> But it was out of the goodness of his heart. There was no contract. And they accepted it from the goodness of his heart. It surprised them. Oh, look at this. He's given us a full day's wages. <laughs> they were humble. There are all kinds of things hiding in here. They didn't push for their rights. That's eros. No. They didn't say, I deserve more. On what basis? on my comparison with them. See, if those other ones had never shown up, they wouldn't have complained. They would have worked all day, got their day's wages, and said, everything's great. But they started looking around and said, wait a minute, they got... The story's loaded. It's agape all the way through. And they, none, nobody understood in those days what he was saying because it was too far above them. They were Eros people trying to understand agape, and you can't do it. Before we leave Eros, I want to look at the word magic. You know what magic is. A little formula, hocus pocus, abracadabra. <laughs> Something happens instantly. That's magic. Bible word for it is sorcery. Eros people are into sorcery. Now be careful here. Can God turn 
that which is inherently evil instantly into something that is inherently good. Do you know the more Adventists I talk to, the more I realize that's what they thought happened at baptism? They expect God to be a sorcerer and snap his fingers. Now you're good. What? Where in the Bible does it say that? When I'm justified by faith, he has done a legal transaction. But for me to get to the place where I'm fit company for the angels, that's going to take some time. That's going to take some effort. That's going to take agape. None of this magic stuff. I was bad yesterday. Today I'm great. Uh, that's Eros, that idea. This magic that God is supposed to do for, for people when they become Christians. Somehow he waves a wand. And it's done. <laughs> hey, that's Harry Potter. That's not the Bible. He says to evil, you know what's evil? <laughs> yeah, that's what Adam did to me, and then I helped him out. <laughs> yeah, I'm evil. Through and through. And God never waved a wand at me, and I know it. That said, moral evil, vanish. Never happened. I'm sorry, it never happened to me. I got fooled like everybody else. I joined the church and I thought everybody was one of those. <laughs> but I found out different right away. And it wasn't fun to learn that. No. In God's plan, man must humbly Produce himself to God. So God can reduce him to nothingness. It's called submission. Have we submitted to this being who created us in the first place so he can do agape in us? So he can take us out of the eros camp entirely? You see, God can only work in the framework of law. There are laws in salvation. And all the churches who teach the law was done away with, they've also done away with salvation. Saying I believe in Jesus doesn't mean anything unless you've made a connection with agape. And when you make that connection, you begin seeing what Eros is, because it's way over there, the opposite of God's love. So now I can say a dangerous thing here. When Jesus said, love your enemies, was that a suggestion? <laughs> well, even Billy Graham knows that. He said, God didn't make a suggestion. That was a command. A command. You mean God commanded me to love? Now, I don't know how many sermons I've heard that say God can never command you to love. Well, what is that? <laughs> God commanded everybody in this room to love. He did not command us to feel mushy about that enemy. He commanded us to esteem that as a person with as much potential for sainthood as I have. To respect that person and present the law and the gospel, Jesus, everything to them so they too can have a chance at this. Love, God's love, the, the kind he can command. And do you know every one of God's true children? Get over there. 
into obedience. Yes. Because there's a principle in them now, not a feeling. We don't do everything in Christianity just because we feel. Now there's always some kind of feeling someplace. And feelings have their place, but not when it comes to being obedient. Obedience is because of a principle. And that principle never bends because that principle is God himself. Have you ever heard the statement? The commandments are a transcript of God's character. <laughs> So that's what that's saying. There are principles there that never change because they're God himself. We're talking about it from the point of view of agape today. Agape. So let's try to bottom this out for the portion we've done today. I still haven't touched where I wanted to go to even today. The hidden manna. Okay, we'll come back. The, the word justice, we haven't even talked about it yet. Suppose God could push a button and say that which was you two seconds ago, evil, is now holy and pure. What have we got to do with that? <laughs> Absolutely nothing. That would be automatic, wouldn't it? Because it pushed a button. That is one of the biggest principles of spiritualism, is to do things automatically. They call it automatism. It's a pagan idea. It has nothing to do with Jesus, the Father, the Bible, nothing about the kingdom of God. God doesn't have any buttons to push. What, what is justice in the kingdom of God? Freedom of the will. Ah, you get to choose. Isn't that wonderful? Now, when we're lost, we can't make spiritual choices, but we still can make choices. Okay? Every man has freedom of choice on that realm. Don't get confused here. The theologians after Luther start talking about the bondage of the will, and they get that all messed up. No, we have freedom of choice. The key word being freedom. You are free to choose God or to reject Him. To believe Him or to not believe Him. To come into His plan of redemption or to stay out of it. To become agape or to stay in eros. This is, this is the most wonderful thing. The reason you are free and not an automaton. Now, Ellen White uses that word automaton, by the way. It means robot. Just do what you're told. No. God doesn't look at anybody here like a robot. He presents to you information that you are able to understand. He's given you an intellect. He's given you a heart to respond with. He's given you all kinds of equipment. You know why he gave you all that. You are a person. Now, that may not mean a lot to you right now, but this is the issue in paganism and spiritualism. Spiritualism teaches you don't count as a person. You are a neutral. You only count to yourself, but you don't count anywhere else. That's what spiritualism teaches. Evolution. Evolution teaches save the species, no matter how many individuals you have to get rid of. Do you see it? Evolution is from the devil. God bends down for one person, the individual. That's the most important thing in God's kingdom. You as a person. And 
Eros dehumanizes everybody. Now, do you still want to be an Eros or do you want to be an Agape? <laughs> there are a lot of issues we never understood, perhaps, about be, being over there with the Eros people. Don't do it. Think it through. Pray. Understand. God has a message for us in the whole Bible. Agape. Agape. How do, how do you show you're a person? God says, I want you to use your intelligence, your understanding, the exposure you have, the capacity that I have given you, the freedom I give you as a person. I'll present this to you. Are you willing to confess? Confess what? <laughs> that you need help. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I need help. Are you willing to confess that my way is right? <laughs> That's a little harder. That's a little harder. Yeah, I know it's hard for Eros people. I want you to get over here with me and Agape. You have to give up Eros. And you know what that is? That's your whole self. <laughs> yeah, you are Eros. That can't go to heaven. That can't be with me in eternity. It's got to die. It's going to stay here. So accept my word. Confess. And here's the thing that makes it work. Luther and Calvin and all the true reformers finally understood it because they had a problem. They were trying to deal with the old church fathers who said, when we become a Christian, we are partially sinners and we are partially saved. And Luther came along and he knew all those old church fathers and he changed it and he said, totalis pakata. 100% total sinner. At the same time, 100% justified. All at the same time. You are not a saint over here that never is going to do something wrong again. You're still a sinner. <laughs> and you are not a part sinner. You are still as much a sinner as you were before you became born again. Now that's hard on Adventists. We want to improve. This is the new improved me. You're not improved. You're redeemed. Everybody sitting in this room is just as lost as the most lost person out there who never heard about Jesus. The only difference between you and them is that Jesus is in your, in your life now. And that's a big difference. Yeah. Amen. But don't you ever give up the idea that you're lost without Jesus. One second without Jesus, you're right back with all the rest of them. That's why God loves everybody the same. We're all the same. <laughs> so what is this thing that Luther and Calvin and the rest of them understood? They had a hard time putting that together. 100% sinner, 100% justified. How do you get that in one person at the same time, all the time? And they wrestled, and they wrestled, and they thought. And they had God reveal things to them. And they studied the Bible, and they came to it. They, they finally understood. And they came to the same thing. Zwingli, all of them. There's a third word. <laughs> and they found it. Metanoia. Metanoia means... Repentance. <laughs> I'm so sorry I'm such a wicked person. <laughs> I'm so sorry I'm who I am without Jesus. What else does it mean? Turning away from sin. That's what agape does. 
It takes you to see how hateful sin is. And when it becomes so hateful, you can't stand it anymore. You're finally going to say, why in the world am I in that? And you make a decision. And that decision holds in eternity because Jesus accepts it. He says, you have come to a proper understanding. I can save you. You're no longer playing these Eros games. You have made the division between Eros people and Agape people. You are with Jesus now. This is why Ellen White says we need to understand the force of the will. We need to decide it. <laughs> yeah. And God says, I honor your freedom of will. I will do what you can't, but I will follow your choice. Your choice. It's just beautiful. The Bible way is the only way. All these theologians have missed it. It is so sad to read those books that they have put out there for people to study in seminaries. It's just no wonder that ministers everywhere are so messed up. They think Eros is from God. In God's mind, we are eternally present in our final form. Don't forget that. We are eternally present to him in our final form. So God has not made any unfair demands of us. Every demand that God has made of us is so that we may turn outward to the other and become total, whole, healed, saved. <laughs> We're part of his cosmos now. We're part of his eternity. And maybe I'll close with this thought because it's a really big thought. There are theologians who have said that God has no friends. He doesn't need any. <laughs> and it's a total misunderstanding of who God is. God himself is other-centered. Do you see this? He is not self-centered. That's what people think he is. That's why we have to pray all the time. That's why we have to ask him things all the time. That's why we have to bow down all the time. That's why they think he's self-centered. No! God isn't like that. God is love. God is agape. And his whole being is out there. That's why he created. So his center could be more and more complete. In all of us, together. So what does that say? If God is other-centered, that means he is dependent upon the others. <laughs> he is not complete without his children. Yeah. God is dependent on you. He, he is dependent on you. Do you hear it? And he's God. <laughs> oh, I was thinking about the other day. It about brought me down. It still baffles me because I don't understand the whole thing yet. I probably never will. But to think that because God is dependent on me, all oh, the terrible things I can do to his glory. Before angels, before worlds, before men. 
What a terrible, terrible message I would give about God. If I presented to the world, he can't change people's lives. It's just a big game. Oh, it hit me like a ton of bricks, and I'm still reeling under it. Oh, the responsibility he lays on me to be his center. God's center. He depends on me. I think I'm going to stop there because I'm going to get involved in what the law is in the heart, and that's going to take me too long. <laughs> we'll, we'll continue next time and, and deal with that. What God means when he says, I will write my law in your heart. We'll see what agape means there. Okay. Father, We have such a little idea of your glory. And yet you have made the way people think and look at you based on us. Help us, Lord, to sense there is no sacrifice too great to present a proper picture of who you are. Help us to sense the damage we would do even to each other by not being consistent. Bless us, Lord. Your agape works. It's the only thing that works. It's a unifier. It makes harmony. It makes totality. It makes eternity. And we thank you that it all stems through love, through the creation. May we sense that you have called us to this world to talk more about a day, more than a day, but to say what that day represents and what it means in the Christian life. We thank you for your patience. And we know that you love the 11th hour workers. Maybe we're still destined to be one of those even though we've been in the church a while. Bless us as we finally come to our senses and we surrender the way you want us to. We thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen.